which most of you should have um, filled out, but this is essentially, it's gonna help us to sort of gain some data about how helpful this course is and like, you know, what our attractive audience is. Um, so if you haven't already filled this out, please, if you could, that would be um, really um, great. Um, so just today's outline for the webinar, we're gonna be doing introduction to white space questions, sort of covering, because I know white space questions have changed a bit in the past year or two, slightly. So just, um, you know, tips about like what you need to look out for and things when um, searching for Dean Reason stuff. Then we'll go into sort of a general approach to white space questions um, and sort of the do's and don'ts of them. Um, and also just looking at um, the breakdown of the new sort of, I think since 2020, well, since last year's application, the way they've changed them um, and what the breakdown is. We'll cover some examples of white, white space questions and how to answer um, most of them. Um, and then just some resources for you guys to go away and have a look at afterwards. And in the end, um, depending on how much time we have, we can do a QA. and a um, With the question and answers, even as I'm going through, if you have any questions, if they come up, just type in the little chat box um, and Antonio is just going to basically pick them up and you know we can either answer them um, as and when or towards the end we will be able to answer them. So so what do we know about white space questions? So first of all white space questions have been centralized. Um, by that I mean that um, you basically have to answer your white space questions once. Different deaneries want different white space questions. So for instance, if you're applying to, this is just an example, um, if you're applying to Bristol and they want, they want your answers for one, two, three, one, two, three white space questions, and you're applying to a different deanery that's asking for white space questions, four, five, six, you essentially need to do all the white space questions for your application. Um, so this is where it's important basically to look at what deanery you're applying to and what their requirement is. So I think there's, you don't do separate applications this time for different um, deaneries that you're applying to. Um, and also not every deanery requires um, white space questions and it's also varied weighting. So just as an example here, so this is Kent, Surrey and Sussex. Um, and they obviously, you know, they don't um, require white space questions, but obviously if you're applying to a deanery that does require white space questions, you will be doing white space questions and they will just be disregarded by um, LAX themselves. Uh, similarly, we have uh, Bristol here who have different things for different um, academic uh, pathways for there. So if you're doing research, then they look at the white space questions for career goals, for achievements and program interests, which isn't taken into account. Whereas if you're doing education and leadership, then you know certain white space questions are taken in, into account that research one doesn't. So again, just honing in the fact that you really need to do your research, um, don't cut short on you know, looking into deaneries. And then, as I said, um, with the varied weighting as well, um, find out what's what's the point system for your deanery. Um, so this is, I think this is Northwest um, shortlisting process. So they give 40, mark, 40, 40 points um, for white space questions. So, you know, like if, for instance, you, you don't have a lot of like academic presentations, posters and things where you're not scoring points, it might be worth looking at deaneries who score you more on white space questions because you'll be able to make your um, uh, uh, application stronger that way. So just going into the breakdown, so this is this along with the individual questions which we will be covering um, is available on the UK FPO website. Um, it's just if you're at Specialized Foundation Program, it comes up right at the bottom and it's got the 2023 and even the 2022 ones uh, questions and they're the same. So you can start preparing for them now, essentially. Um, so the categories essentially cover uh, that, that are covered um, are general career goals, your program interests and rationale for each, achievements and experience and team working. Now, the program interest and rationale for each, you only do the one that you're applying for. So you don't, you don't essentially do all three of them. But if you are choosing leadership and education for two separate deaneries or for the same deanery or whatever, then you need to do whatever you choose basically. So how to approach white space questions. So there's different ways to do them. There's no 
right way, essentially. It's whatever you feel um, suits you better or whatever you feel is much more applicable to the way you want to answer your questions. Um, so first of all, we've got an approach called the sandwich approach. Now, this essentially means that you answer the question directly in like a few sentences. We'll do examples of this later on anyway, um, just to hone in um, what this approach is. But you basically have a question. You answer that question um, directly first. So for instance, tell us about your research achievement. And you can say, well, I did a systematic review where I did a cohort study. Um, and then you basically... Um, balance that with the skills that you gained and how you gained them. And then obviously um, sort of at the end, you're also adding on um, how you can relate that to the SFP. So that's like a little sandwich approach to so start, middle, and then end it in the end. STAR is obviously situation, task, action, result, and reflection. You might have come across as quite popular. It's really good to answer questions for leadership, for education, for management, um, any, anywhere there's like a task sort of involved, but even for research, you can actually use this for anything, to be honest. Um, and CAMP is clinical, academic, management, and personal. Again, we'll go over this, but this is really good for like background and motivation questions because it gives you a very holistic approach um, to them. And lastly, you can just create your own. You don't have to follow the three um, that we've discussed here. The main thing is you answer the question to the point, you demonstrate what skills you've gained and you show what you've learned from them. So this is just like a general attitude to have towards any question that you're answering. Have an opening sentence, answer the question a sentence or two. What did you do? What skills did you learn? Or what skills did you use? How did you use and learn those skills? future implications of those learned skills. So did you take those skills and did something else later on? And how will those skills be applicable or transferable to the SFP? If you sort of think about those for every question you're answering, I think you will have a well-rounded question, well-rounded answer, sorry. So where to begin? Um, so this is a diagram that one of our co-founders, Kitty, basically um, had talked about previously. Um, and it's basically, you know, the good thing with this is you can like list all your achievements because you must have done a lot of stuff at medical school, whether it's sports, whether it's other societies, whether it's medical societies, whether it's teaching, whether it's research, um, just list all your academic and non-academic achievements. And then try and write down what skills you've gained from each. After you've done that, then you can link those to like which achievement and skill is best suited to what white space question. It's a really good way of sort of, you know, making sure that you're not repeating the same skill over and over again in the same, uh, in different questions and that you're giving them like well-rounded application overall. Um, so, now let's jump into like what the questions are. So first of all, um, it's, you know, you have some general questions, which are essentially, sorry, I'm going to remove this, I can read. Um, so the first, the first question essentially is asking you, how are you going to use your time as an SFP? You can just read the first question in your own time. It's just on the top. Now, here you can use a camp structure so such as clinical how do you want to develop your clinical skills how will you set that up in place is there a specific department that you're keen on working in um academic so at, from the start so if you if you read the first question carefully it basically says that how will you like how will you optimize the sfp program from the start of your training so do you have like a certain person in mind that you want to work with or you know even if you say oh i'm going to like be proactive and like use buzzwords like that to identify a supervisor i'm going to develop a research proposal i already have a research proposal you can talk about management so any rep roles that you're interested in or any rep roles that you already have that will translate into any rep roles that you want to do um, and obviously personal, like reflect on what skills you have and what you would like to build on and how would you build on them at, as starting your um, SFP program. So the second question um, is quite an interesting one. And actually it wasn't there when me and Antonio applied and it's only come in since I think last year. Um, so obviously we don't have like a model answer for this but from what our understanding is that this question you know it's it's an opportunity for for you to a highlight a high priority research interest 
sorry, research that interests you in specific, because you can talk about sort of if you're interested in diabetes, for instance, you can talk about any high priority research within diabetes. Now, what do we mean by like high priorities? Like, you know, this is again, just our interpretation of it. Um, essentially, you want to know about how it affects the public, the impact of that research, or if there's a gap in that research, why is that important to sort of um, fill? Like what work has been done so far? How will you fill that gap if you were to? Um, mortality rates, morbidity rates, how it would sort of have like a lasting impact. And also, I think because um, me and Antonio are having a discussion about this, and I think um, Antonio brought up how... I think it's important to sort of give them an idea that you have an understanding of evidence-based medicine um, and you want to sort of link it back to whatever example you've chosen and link it again back to the SFP um, and how sort of you might be able to sort of fill that gap in your project or even if not then you know just giving them an idea if that you really understand what evidence-based medicine is and why it's important. So next we've got career goals. Um, so the question essentially is, you know, what are your specific reasons for applying for this special ex um, experience program? I did think this was a bit similar to the first question as a general question. Um, and it might be that where, wherever you're applying, um, that they might not ask, they might only ask you one of the questions to submit. Um, but obviously have a look at that. But I think this in general is specifically asking for your academic career. So it's asking for um, what do you know about the Specialized Foundation program? Do you know anything about the deaneries that you're applying to? Is it a one day release alongside clinical stuff throughout the year? Do you get like a block um, in your F2 to do, to do research work? Um, knowing stuff like that is quite important, but equally knowing the academic pathway is quite important. So, sorry, can everyone see my screen without? There we go, okay. So knowing the academic, um, knowing the, what's, uh, sorry, knowing the academic pathway is quite important. I'll just put a picture on here for you guys to sort of digest in your own time. Um, again, this question, we can sort of use um, the camp uh, pathway, pathway, sorry, uh, mnemonic to answer it. So such as you can talk about um, clinical interests. Are you interested in like a specific patient cohort or again, a specific department um, that you might want to work in? Academic, are there any local or even national collaboratives at the DNV that you're applying to that you want to sort of work with? Is there like a professor or a senior lecturer that you are really keen in working with or um, you've read their research and um, essentially things like that you can sort of include in this answer. Um, management, again, are there any committees, leadership and educational roles um, that you would be interested in applying to? But also the, the main thing is for this question is the personal bit. Where do you see yourself in five years? Like if you're embarking on a specialized foundation program, do you really understand what an academic life entails or what opportunities you might have in the future? And have you thought about that? So it's really good to sort of discuss your career aspirations, but again, using the key points that we'd mentioned earlier, always, always tell them about the skills for any question that they're asking. You can always throw in some skills that either you will transfer, some, some skills that you will learn and like how you will transfer or learn them. So the next bit is about the program interest and rationale. Now, because I come from a med ed background, I'm all, I, I've given you guys a um, example of a previous relevant teaching experience. Um, and this is essentially that what I wrote, and it's not the full um, ex, like full blurb, essentially, because that was around 250 words or something. So I've just taken the bits of it. And when I wrote my answer to this, I used the STAR um, model for it, essentially. Um, and going back to what we were covering earlier, always answer the question first in a few sentences. So please describe your previous relevant teaching experience as a teacher within and outside medicine. So I started off with, 
you know, I have extensive experience of teaching, um, ranging supporting children with special needs at a secondary school to tutoring A-level students to hosting revision sessions for students at university. So just at the start, you've given them a very sort of well-rounded telling them, actually, I've done more than one thing in teaching. Then you sort of identify and write down about your task. Um, just again, a few sentences, because the main chunk of it should be the skills that you le you've learned and how you've learned them, rather than, you know, setting the scene. So just a few sentences about what you did. Um, and then moving on to action, again, within that setting, what were you doing? So, you know, I over overcame the challenge of dealing with disruptive behavior by using positive feedback strategies. So this was all good, but then as a result, what happened? So as a result, all my students were promoted further with those studying A-levels succeeding through the university. So after that, I've done a little reflection of how I then went on to use these skills in the future. So, you know, harnessing similar teaching principles, I hosted multiple revision sessions for Kilo Medical Education Society, and so on. I went on talking about how I developed those sessions. And with, with when you're mentioning teaching, it's important to show change or like impact so it's really good to say oh yeah I've done this 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 but actually it's really important to tell them well what was the impact of that teaching or even if you say stuff like so I did this I collected feedback and then this is how I changed my teaching to reap this impact that is again it, it shows like a feedback cycle and I think that's that's what they re really like to see um that you sort of can um you know have that sort of development cycle within teaching and also always close um, your and any question that you're doing with a well-rounded a well-rounded um, answer to how those skills link to SFP or um, essentially like the way I've used it is like as an academic clinician I wanted to use my platform to teach and inspire younger generation of academics undertaking a medical education in SFP would give me an opportunity to understand and apply educational theory to practice. So, just recapping this again. So opening sentence, what did you do? What skills did you use and learn? How did you use and learn those skills? Future implications of those learned skills and how will those skills be applicable and transferable to SFP? So just, I've, I've not got proper examples for these. However, I thought it would be good to sort of just discuss things that you could potentially mention. So with research, research your, as I outline your previous research experience and achievements. So here again, if you, you know, when you do that little diagram of like putting your achievements together and then sort of, um, you know, um, di digressing to what skills you've reached, choose choose a research experience that has yielded high sort of you've received high outputs from it so something that has led to a poster or a prize or like um a, a presentation or even like a paper um equally it is okay if you don't have any of those or if you have any of those in the process that is also good to talk about but also, if you don't have any high outputs, that's also fine. Just talk about a research experience, excuse me, talk about a research experience that um, ha sh shows a lot of skills basically and shows that you understand research. Key words here, like buzzwords, would be to mention stuff like, you know, what kind of research it was. So whether it was um, a study, whether it was lab based, whether it was an audit, um, you know, what skills essentially you gained from them. Um, how much, what, what did you do? What was your involvement? Were you just data collecting? Were you involved in analysis? Were you involved in developing the protocol? You want to mention all of these things. An interesting thing, again, would be to sort of talk about whether you were involved in writing um, the report, whether you were invo involved in the editorial process. So all of those things are like quite key to sort of highlight when you're talking about your research experience. And also notice that they've not asked for one research experience. So you can sort of formulate an answer, um, you know, including various research experiences. So if you were involved in data collection for one thing, but actually you did analysis for another thing, you can combine those two experiences together to form an answer for this. With leadership, it's asking you to give one example in which you have demonstrated your leadership abilities and it needs to be specific role. So you need to, again, tell them exactly what you did and your contribution as a leader. 
And now the end bit where it says like it's relevance to academic activities. This isn't essentially saying that you need to give a leadership example in academia. It's just saying you need to link it back to academic activities. So this answer would be really easy if you've, you know, like we, we should all be able to answer this. Um, if you were a part of any society, um, it'll be easier if you are a part of a medical society because you can obviously just link it to academia very directly. But even if you were part of a society that wasn't related to medicine, um, you can still answer that as long as you're using. And another key thing is, even though you're talking about leadership, you can still use word, you can still talk about teamwork um, and communication here. And because those essentially are part of leadership, delegation, it's those buzzwords basically that would make your um, application really stand out. So just have a, have a little think um, about basically what leadership example best suits um you know your answer it could it could even be something like um again um leading a project or leading um a fundraising event so you know the, the world's your oyster depending on what you've done so next i've got another example so this is for achievements and experience um now over here you've got um the first one is asking about your best clinical or research achievement. Um, now, again, going back to the previous slide where they talked about, please outline your previous research experience and achievements. You don't wanna double up your answer between this and the achievements bit, okay? So you really want to think about, and especially depending on what Dean Rees are asking for what, um, uh, you really want to sort of, again, have that list and pick out the best things that you've done. Um, over here, you definitely, th th so I'll go through the structure of like my answer here, which again, it's not the full answer, but just has like the main, some of the main bits within it. Um, again, I've used a sandwich approach for this. Um, so a concise, very structured sentence answering the, the question. So what is your single best clinical research achievement? I co-authored a systematic review and a national poster comparing efficacies of assistive technologies in cervical spinal cord injury. The next um, bit, I'm basically giving my evidence for this. So this is now published in the Journal of Spinal Cord Medicine and has been presented at the National Movement in the Real World Symposium. Um, actually, um, I think when I was initially applying for this, it was in the process of being published as well. Um, so again, even if you have something in the process, you can still talk about it. Um, then I go on to talk about the skills that, like how I was involved within it and the skills that I learned. One of the things that I haven't highlighted here is like how I gained those skills because I just didn't think I had like the capacity to include that on my screen. Um, so where I've highlighted teamwork, time management and organization, you would then basically go on to break down each of those skills and how you develop those skills or how you hone those skills, essentially, and then how those skills will be helpful in developing further projects as an uh, in SFP. Similar to question two, give one example of a non-academic achievement and its significance to your application for the specialized experience program. On here, again, it's it's a non-academic non -academic achievement. It could be, you can talk about volunteering, you can talk about fundraising, you can talk about, you know, any, anything you want, essentially. And this is why, again, the, um, it, the exercise at the start of trying to figure out what achievements you have um, are really important. I even talked about achievements from some of some before my undergraduate um essentially and then linked it into my undergraduate but again depending on how much um how much you have to talk about and if you're if you sort of need to stretch some words here and there. so the last one I think this is the last one um we've got team working so with this one as well um you know read the question really really properly um, it is asking for teamwork and relevance to foundation training. Again, it's not asking for academic teamwork as such. It's just asking for teamwork as long as you can link it back to foundation training. It doesn't necessarily need to be clinical. You can talk about academia. You can talk about a non-clinical experience within this. For this, you can use a STAR approach, I think. But again, you can use whichever approach you think is best. 
So for STAR, again, it would be just describing the situation and task, um, talking about your sort of action, what you did. And then um, R is like, as, as a result of that, what happened? Um, what was the impact? And how will you take that further? And then link it back to how this applies to foundation training. So just to cover a bit more of like the do's and the don'ts. So identify specific achievements that best fit with your white space questions. I think I've talked about this to death. <laughs> um, the next one is essentially make your answers personal. What is your role? What did you do? What skills did you gain? Like, so don't, don't waste time on general um sentences essentially that don't really tell me anything specific to you you'll only be wasting your word count um so i've just got a um, few buzzwords here and this is to no means you know the end of all end all and be all um there's plenty of more things that you could include like delegation and things that i was covering throughout my talk um but it's, it's important to sort of throw those in because they will demonstrate well-roundedness and also demonstrate sort of variety of skills also show a commitment to your area of interest. There's plenty of opportunity to tell them about who you are and what you're interested in. And specifically, um, you know, it doesn't even have to be research. It, your application can just give us an idea of um, what essentially your interests are um, outside of medicine and even in medicine. So sell your potential and be proud of it. So the don'ts, as I said earlier, um don't generalize you have a limited word count just telling me that oh i am a um aspiring surgeon who is very enthusiastic about research doesn't really tell me anything about you um so be specific um you know or for instance like i am an uh, I, i'm an aspiring surgeon interested in orthopedics i want to undertake the academic program because um, I want to be a clinical lectureship in orthopedics and da, 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 da. you know, it, it, it give me more than just sort of, oh, I want to do this. Um, mention things that, do, sorry, don't mention things you have not done. Um, you will be interviewed on your white space questions if you make it through to the interview stage. Um, and, you know, you obviously, I'm, I'm pretty sure no one's not going to do this, basically. No one's going to do this. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't want it to be a probity issue. Um, and if you can't back it up with evidence, avoid. So there are certain things that we might have done, but actually we don't have any evidence for it. So you don't have a certificate and things. So just be wary because I, you are asked to submit a portfolio and like you might be asked at your interview stage to basically bring in things. Um, so you, again, you don't want to get caught out um, by certain uh, achievements. Um, as we said before, don't just don't just list achievements. Don't in, in your answers, don't just say, oh, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. Um, definitely mention about how how what you've done, what you gained, what you learned. Don't leave drafting your white space questions last minute. Start now. It's the best thing you would do, basically, if you're applying to a, a dean degree that's white space questions heavy, which takes me to my top tips. So Choose your deanery wisely. You know, if if you think, I mean, that's the thing. There's there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just things to think about. So, just food for thought essentially would be, um, if you don't have a lot of academic achievements, you might think actually, I think I can make my application strong by just doing white space questions. So you might think, okay, well, I'll just apply to two deaneries, both with white space quest white space questions. Equally, you might think that, oh, I actually, I've got a few academic staff and I can also do white space questions, in which case you might think, oh, actually, I might do one academic and one white space questions. I think something to think about would be you don't want to do, well, not that you don't want to do, obviously, it's, it's completely up to you what you what you end up applying for. But just to think about would be if you are going for um, two deaneries that do white space questions, you are heavily relying on your white space questions to be really good. So, you know, just, just, just to think about things essentially. So do your homework. Don't slack on um, not doing your research. Read the person specifications for each um, university, not university, sorry, deanery. Write confidently and be proud of what you've achieved. Use your best achievements, as we've already discussed. 
um, and give yourselves plenty of time to draft answers and get plenty of feedback on your white space questions. So send them around, send them to your friends, send them to other people who are also doing the academic, applying for the program. You can send it to your supervisors or just you know um, ask someone in your medical school, if, you're, if not your supervisor, anyone in the academia essentially to have a read of it and give you some advice. Be specific, structured and concise, don't generalize. And lastly, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. I was someone who wasn't gonna go for the AFP program and only because I had the typical um, imposter syndrome of, oh, I've got nothing compared to anyone else. And actually, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that I did push myself and I went for it. And I think the main thing here is that, the, I think the only thing is that it does take a lot of your time. It will take a time to prep for white space questions. It will take time to do the interview um, interview prep and do interviews and things. But at the end of the day, you have everything to gain um, and, you know, only a bit of time to lose. And it is, it is there's, there's so much perks to doing the academic program. So these are your resources. Um, so obviously we have the SFP website and obviously I know um, Kitty, who's our co-founder, has her own YouTube channel where she discusses, I think, some of her examples of white space questions. Um, but just to be mindful that when, again, Kitty applied as well, the white space questions were slightly different. But still, the structure of them are still the same. So if you're struggling to sort of just understand how to structure them, feel free to, like, go check out Kitty's YouTube as well and the SFP website. Um, I think most of the questions are the same. It's just a few here and there that are quite different, um, but just as, like, additional resources. Any questions? Right, so Zaha, there's been a couple of questions. Um, I think we should probably start from the top, but just at the start, kind of people were saying, um, so can you apply to multiple deaneries in one application? Um, so I kind of explained that uh, you are applying to two deaneries, um, you know, when you're applying on Oreo, but that the same application is going to be going to both of them. So then the kind of follow-up question to that from someone else was that if they're asking for overlapping white space questions, can you write separate answers for each of them or are you only allowed a single response? So I kind of answered that with being, you know, there is only a single answer, unfortunately, but I was hoping that maybe you could give us some advice as to what kind of would you do in order to make those answers fit both applications? Yeah, I think this is something, again, we, we did ponder about because, you know, previously we had um, applications going, to, like if we had white space questions, you could do two separate ones. But now that that's centralized, um, I think you can still answer questions without make. well, I mean, I, I, I guess the annoying bit there is that actually you can't make it too direct because if both the academic programs you're applying to are going to read the same questions, then you want to make it as general, but also specific to both of them. Um, so I think for example, the example would be when we're talking about, let me watch, you know, there's no need to go back. Um, you know, the first few ones where we're talking about the career um, and the first few ones where like, how will you utilize your specialized program? Now, of course, every dean we does have a specific specialized program. And I think, just keeping it as, so I'm just trying to think of an example of how you would um, keep it sort of general, but like, for instance, um, do you have an example, Antonio, for, for, for how you would sort of answer any of those with like a generalized approach? So I would probably say things like, um, you know, opportunities for, PG certificates or things like that are usually present in most of the applications, but it does show that you have looked into what actually is there for an option, like what kind of options are there for you. Um, so that's useful to just mention those things. Yeah. Or I think, to, um, sorry. Uh, sorry, no, no, please. Yeah, I think, again, like some, some places, for instance, have like a big orthopedic research department and you putting that in, being like you're interested in orthopedics, like within your question essentially would sort of just highlight decompress like if some places have specific research um departments that are very popular and very well known and you're just putting that within your application without specifically saying oh your research like you know the research department and blah 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 you don't have to put the name of 
the deanery, but you can just say, actually, like, I'm very keen to undertake X, Y, or Z research. Um, so, you know, so it would, it is still kind of answering the question. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree with that, absolutely. Um, kind of following on from that, uh, someone's asking, can you apply to education SFP in one deanery and leadership SFP in the same deanery? Well, you could when I was applying, but I'm ass I'm assuming you can still. I don't I don't I don't see why not. Like when I applied to Yorkshire Humber, I applied for research, med ed, and leadership. I don't know. I, actually, I don't think they do leadership here. But I applied for research and um, med ed. You have the option. I think what the way it works is that you can, um, from my understanding. Um, but I think, again, things will be much clearer for you guys when you start, when the Oriel application opens as well. Um, but I think on Oriel, when you have the option to choose your type of um, research AFP, you obviously choose, for instance, if you're doing research and if you're doing med ed, you're going to choose research med ed. And if you're doing leadership, you choose leadership as well. And then you write the rationale for it. And I think when you're applying to the place, um, they have certain jobs and the jobs basically would include a research AFP, a meta AFP or a leadership AFP, and you rank them. So if you obviously are going for like, I think research more then you would put research on top. And then if you're going for like meta next, you would then rank meta if, if that makes sense. At least that was the case when I was applying. So and back in the day, back in the day, you know, because we're both F2s now, um, but at the time, it was that case maybe for Yorkshire and Humber, but for example, in Bristol um, and in the peninsula, it was very clear from the start whether or not you would got uh, get a research or an education SFP. Um, so you would apply specifically to those um, places. I think, you know, it's no problem at all to apply to edu education and leadership. And I applied to education, leadership and research as well. Um, but it's just going to be more effort if that makes sense, because like you are going to have to answer the leadership white space questions, you're going to have to answer the research white space questions or the education white space questions as well. So that might be the only thing that could potentially put you off. I think the, the pro to that is though that, so for instance, I, with Yorkshire and Humber, I actually wanted the research one, um, research AFP, and I had to do the rankings before I put my application in essentially. And I wanted the research one, but actually I got offered med ed. And it's something that I didn't even consider. Like I, I, I ranked it because I was like, you know what? Actually, if I if if I didn't get research, I wouldn't mind doing med ed. But actually, I'm quite glad I got med ed because I did have a lot of research experience. And what I didn't have much of in terms of portfolio building was med ed, and it's definitely put me in like a good position for my portfolio. And so I think it is something again to to think about. And yeah, and I think the only only thing, as we said, would be just a bit more time on certain other white space questions. Yeah. So I'm not going to go kind of in order of people writing, but I'm just going to go into kind of the topics that we are at now. Mm -hmm. So um, someone asked, uh, when you apply to two deaneries, do you need to indicate a preference? And then do you rank the jobs within each one? I think so. I think that's what we were just discussing. Right? Like, Yeah, so well, so you so I think what the question also refers to is when you apply, you apply to the deanery first. Yeah. then you either get accepted for that deanery. So then in January, everyone has like 48 hours to kind of either say, yes, I want that job or I don't want the job if you do get an offer. And then there's a second round where people again say whether or not they want the job. Um, but if you have declined a job in the first round, then you can't get your second round job, if that makes sense. But when you get offered the job, it's only for the specific deanery. This is, um, I know this is a bit complicated, um, so you basically, you know, let's say I, I applied to um, Manchester and Bristol, really, or like the deaneries of Manchester and Bristol. Then I got into Bristol the first round. So I accepted that offer. Um, so even if I had gotten Manchester in the second round, I could have never taken that on because I would have had to decline Bristol. Then once you've got your deanery set, you then have to rank the dean uh, the the different jobs so then i would rank i'd rank my research job and i ranked uh, what kind of rotations i wanted as well and then depending on the rank of the total people that applied or got the job you will get said said uh, topic basically said research topic or said um jobs 
that makes sense. But again, it also depends on the deanery. But generally speaking, you first get the deanery, then you get the job after. So when you accept the job from the deanery, you don't actually know what job you've accepted. You don't actually know whether or not you've accepted, you know, orthopedics as an F1 or geriatrics. So yeah. it's a bit complicated. So the next question is, um, do you get two deaneries per subtype? So two deaneries for research, two for education, two for leadership, or is it just two overall? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I, I thought it was two overall. But I so think... I agree. Yeah, it's definitely two overall. So you cannot... Uh, so you can apply to two deaneries, but then you can apply for research, education, and leadership for so all three things in those two deaneries but in total you can only apply for two so yeah j just just to just to clarify that as well you you have two deaneries not two up not two you're not applying to two subtypes if that makes sense so it's not like you, you can only do one research one med ed so as long as you've got two deaneries you can apply to those two deaneries with however many applications you want yeah then can you then decline the actual job in the deanery and rejoin the generic FP pool? So yes, you can. Mm -hmm. So you can decline the, so wait, sorry, no. So once you've accepted the deanery and you've ranked your jobs and you've got a job, you can never return back to the generic FP pool. So you can only do that if you decline the deanery at the start. But when you get offered the job from the deanery, you will usually know whether or not it's research or education or leadership yeah. that day. So if you get something that you didn't want, you can decline it. If you get a location in the deanery that you didn't want, you can also decline it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another question. So my understanding is that some deaneries require applicants to answer all questions, regardless of pro program interests. So that's education, research, leadership. I haven't checked for this year, but the Northern AFP at least used to do this. Do you have any idea on whether an applicant is disadvantaged if they're less experienced in one or more of these domains? For example, mainly interested in research, so most of evidence is for this. Um, I think, so sorry, so so, so you're, what, what's the question in summary? <laughs> so basically it's, um, if you, have a really really strong research uh portfolio basically uh -huh. but you don't have a lot to write about in leadership or in education will you be marked down even if you have to answer all of those white space questions um mm -hmm. despite the fact that you only apply to the research F sfp for example so that's interesting i think with um what i was reading on the uk fpo website on the little, oh, I wish I, I put it in, but like, it basically said that you had to choose what AFP you're applying to and then give the rationale for only that AFP. If for instance, you have to give the rationale for all three of them, then as long as you've made the research one more like strong because you're applying for the research one, it shouldn't necessarily affect, I mean, to be honest, we won't really be able to answer this question to the T because we obviously don't work for that specific gain rate or we don't really know the process for that. But I think if you're applying for the, re like according to UK FP document, um, from my understanding, you're only allowed, you're only supposed to provide the rationale. If we're talking about the rationale, correct us, if, we're, if you're talking about one of the other questions, if you're talking about the rationale bit, then you're only supposed to provide the rationale for the AFP you're applying to. Yes, you will still, you still might be able, sorry, they still might, ask you to fill in the questions for leadership, the, the question for leadership, but not the rationale. So I'm not sure which, which one you're talking about, but if you're talking about the question that involves leadership, give us like one leadership example, um, in which case, if they've put that in, even if you're applying for a research job, then you have to answer that question to the best of your abilities, because that's not the rationale, that's asking you about your leadership qualities. Um, in which case, just just really think about it doesn't have to be a known committee position in things. I'm pretty sure you've done something that can you can link back into, even if it's like leading a team of two, it doesn't really matter. I agree with that. And also, even if your leadership experience is research related, that is absolutely fine. So you can potentially write, you know, I showed or I learned something about my leadership and management skills because I had to 
you know, organize my time or organize this research group or kind of, you know, you can sometimes even be the leader of a clinical, um, if, if you're if you're doing any kind of research in a clinical setting, then you're in a way a leader to the patients, you know, so all of those things are still relevant. So just, yeah, just doctor the question a little bit, if that makes sense. I hope we've answered the question. Yeah, I think I think we have. So she's just written thanks. That makes sense. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, then uh, one more question about this is: so if you apply to a deanery but were keen to apply for all three within that deanery, do you know how to do that, or will it be different for each place? So I think it's just going to be on Oriel. Just yeah. do whatever Oriel says. It might be slightly different for each place because they might be asking for slightly different white space questions but they will tell you exactly what to do on Oreo and it will depend on the application. I was just going to say, yeah, like I know th these are all anxieties because, you know, Oreo is not open yet, but once it's open, you have enough time to figure out what's going on. And I'm pretty sure at every university as well, there will be an assigned lead who will know about Oreo. So if you're struggling to sort of go through Oreo, like just contact your university and just ask for help in terms of if you can't understand something. Mm hmm Right, so Sophie Lewis has written several times that she would like to see the first few slides. Um, so just to look at uh, how each section was scored. So the zero to 10 points for the white space questions. Okay, so that is actually, that is just an example of, for, I think, I, I can't remember if it's, I, don't, I can't even remember if it's North, I think it's Northwest, let me just go back. It's not for every deanery. So this is just an example of one deanery using it. Every deanery is going to have a different um, point system. So the, the whole point of this um, this slide is to tell you to do your research, basically, so you know um, what what how how the sort of marking is, how the weighting is between academia and white space questions. And that will also usually be available on Oreo. So yeah when I applied there was a whole thing kind of a pdf or something similar where you could just open that up from the application site and they would then give you information as to how things were scored and what you needed to do exactly yeah but in the meantime you can also find this on the um sorry deanery websites excuse me if you know what deanery you're applying want to apply to um all of this was re very readily available to me I didn't have to dig very deep basically I just typed in Bristol deanery sfp scoring <laughs> and it's, it's it's basically all there for some deaneries it's not and for some deaneries you might need to wait for oil to give you that information but for some there is yeah and um so then there was a couple of questions just generally about kind of uh proof so what counts as evidence mm -hmm. um so one question was um so do all deaneries require publications to be PubMed ID'd? Um, yeah, so do you need a PubMed ID for your publications? Um, do, I, I don't think, oh, actually, I don't know. Do so you? I think this depends because yeah. if, so you get just generally when you're scoring, when you're getting scored, um, obviously there's going to be a score for, you know, whatever decile you are at in medical school, then there is a score for whether or not you've got an extra a degree and whether or not that was like a first or second class degree and so on. And then you can get a maximum of three points um, for publications. And for those publications, they only count if you put in the PubMed ID because you need to, you need to put in the PubMed ID onto Oreo. However, if you want those publications to count towards your white space questions and want to show evidence of that, then it's absolutely fine that you don't have a PubMed ID. You can just, for example, upload the paper or you can upload the link to the paper online and so on. But for those three points that don't count toward your white space questions, but count separately to your overall score, that needs to be PubMed ID, basically. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Then another question was, would we have to provide evidence for the non-academic achievements question and what could be used for this? excuse me non-academic achievement let's go to it's just so weird so back you know when when we applied I remember not 
having any evidence for non-academic achievements, but basically just writing, you know, I was doing this in this sport or whatnot and explaining, I guess almost your evidence is the fact that you can actually speak about it in your white space question and that you can reflect on it. Yeah, I think with the, with the evidence bit as well, I'm not, I don't know a lot of people who were actually like told to bring in evidence. For some people, their portfolio was checked in person, um, but for some it wasn't, but you just don't want to be in a position where basically, you know, so for instance, they will tell you if they want you to bring in like a portfolio, for instance. So even if it's like a non-academic achievement, which is like, let's say you were a part of a society outside of medicine at uni, I'm pretty sure you went to the SU and stuff, they'd be able to give you some sort of proof that you've done X, Y, or Z. Um, but even as, yeah, as Antonio was saying, like you don't necessarily, not, I don't think you have to provide proof evidence unless asked for. Um, so your evidence in writing essentially is that you can speak about it and talk about it at interviews and in your white space questions. And that kind of um, leads on to another question. Um, so did you make reference to your white space questions during interview? Um, so they, honestly, the interview is such a tight, um, timed, well-oiled machine. You literally, you, you literally answer what they tell you. But absolutely, in terms of like making reference, if you were talking about, did I, did I talk about things that I put in my white space questions? Absolutely. Because when you actually write your white space questions and by the end of it, the, it, your white space questions should be essentially like the cream of all of your achievements. Like that is how it comes out essentially. Everything like the, 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 the top of the top that you've done. And eventually when you're at your um, interview and they ask about certain things, you, I, I did sort of check in, like the only thing that I had was a publication. I didn't have anything else basically. And I definitely tried to, you know, sell that in, or again, depends on your question. But yeah, if, if you mean, can you use the content of your white space questions? Absolutely. If, if that's the question that they're asking. So I think even I would recommend making sure that, so you assume that they've not read your white space questions. Yeah. Okay, so they're not going to ask you specific questions about those white space questions, usually. Um, not in my experience, anyway. It is, as as you've said, Zaha, like it is incredibly, it's such a short period of time. Like you, you will literally go in and out of the interview and you felt like, I've not even spoken about half the things that I wanted to. Um, but it's really important that because people write white space questions and they write, you know, the, their best achievements in it, and then they realize when they go to the interview, they assume that, you know, the, the interviewer already knows about the white space questions and then leaves out, like, then you might leave out really important things that obviously are the best thing that's, the things that you've achieved. So you should definitely still talk about all of your achievements as if you've never written them down. So just speak about them, explain again what you have achieved. Because really the white space questions are used to decide who's actually going to go for interview yeah. Um, as well so yeah just a completely just practice all of that again you know add things obviously but usually the the questions are very very targeted anyway yeah cool okay so there's one more question um that's just come in so jory just sorry just to clarify at the first offer before you rank jobs will you know the location within the deanery Useful to know as some deaneries are huge like Scotland or Wales and others would, and that would hugely impact your decision. So yes, you will know which location you're in. Um, so you'll get the city usually. So I knew that I was gonna go to Bristol um, in the Severn Deanery and several of my friends who applied to Scotland would then know whether or not they were going to Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee and so on. So you definitely know the city, but you don't know your exact jobs. Right, there's another question, sorry. What's the distinction between something being local versus something being regional? So a local or a regional teaching program, a local or a regional leadership role, and especially if your area region only has one medical school. Sorry, say that again. So a local and regional. So what's the difference between something being a local teaching program or regional teaching program? Okay. So um, a local regional, regional program do you mean something that you've organized or something that you're 
part of essentially like a, a local regional program is something that you're delivering just to your university essentially so that would be just local to you a regional would be you're delivering it to more universities basically within your region so for instance let's take York Chinham because it's like the biggest deanery so if I was a Leeds medical student or a Sheffield medical student if I was doing something just in Sheffield then that would be local if I was doing something in Sheffield that was also that the students in Leeds were also a part of then that's regional and I mean a part of in terms of if they were also gauging in it if then it becomes national obviously when there is like you're out of the region where for instance if you have something being hosted up in Leeds but actually um, people from London are also attending it so that's national I hope that explains that I think so the only caveat to that is he's asking specifically especially if your area slash region only has one medical school um so let's say if you're in Wales and it only has Cardiff and yeah. you're doing a teaching programme in Cardiff, does that count as regional or local? I think it would still count as local. I think I agree with Saha there. Um, you know, we're obviously not the people who are going to rank whoever it is that you did, but we pro- we think that that's probably going local. to be a regional thing rather than a local thing, sorry. Yeah. Cool. Right, so that's um, us kind of having done an hour of webinar. I hope most of the questions have been answered. Um, Sorry, there's just one more thing that's come in. If you are not the first author presenting for presentations or publications, do these count as well? Yes, they do count, but you do have to specify that you were not the first author. Yeah, and again, it's, it's, it's different when you're doing that for academic versus your white space questions for white space questions you know there again obviously is no point system for first author second author but for academia there is so when you're putting your academic achievements as like a list of things then yeah definitely um I think you'll get like a a few lesser marks maybe but it it does count um but for white space questions that's a great thing to sort of elaborate on yeah I agree with that I think it might be that if the for those three marks that you could get that count generally you might only get those if you were the first author of a presentation but don't quote me on that um uh, sorry not a presentation of a publication um but that's just something that you will see when you're on Oriole and see what kind of points you can get for things and I guess it's not something to stress about because really it's a great thing if you've gotten a publication no matter whether or not you're first or second author or not okay cool I hope we've answered all the questions thank you so much Saha for your lovely presentation Oh, thank you. And thank you to everyone as well. Our next webinar is next Sunday. Yep. We'll um, try and make all of the recordings available to you guys as soon as possible. But it's kind of been, there's been a bit of a hold up, but, so it might take a little while. There, In the meantime, though, there are a couple of recordings available from the last couple of years. Um, that should be on the YouTube and on the webpage as well.